You are listening to the Two and Out CFL Podcast, a proud member of the Canadian Football Podcast Network. And week 14 of the CFL season is on tap. I'm Travis Curra, joined by Sheldon Jones. Off the top of the show, we do have to wish a happy birthday to Mrs. Jones. I don't know if she uh, enjoys the, the spotlight that a platform like Two and Out provides to hundreds of thousands of people, Sheldon. But uh, a very happy <laughs> birthday to your mom. Yes, happy birthday, mommy. My dad watches and listens, so at least he'll tell her. Yeah, see? See? He can pass along the message, and uh, I hear you're going to a a very upscale uh, steakhouse tonight. Uh, Oh, the most (laughs) upscale... In uh, chain market, chain restaurant, hey, the keg. Hey, hey, I love the keg. So. I do too, actually. Uh, uh, what's your go-to means, there? Oh, just like a a steak. It doesn't matter. Sometimes I switch it up. Sometimes you know, fillet. Sometimes sirloin. Probably a sirloin, but a Billy Miner pie. That's that's literally the reason to go there is because that's the greatest freaking dessert on the planet. I was just going to bring that up. That is a legendary uh, dessert among keg goers. So please oh. enjoy that Billy Minor pie. I promise you I will. <laughs> Probably even more than my mom. <laughs> <laughs> hey, does she get a free one? She does. Yes. Okay. So then we'll get us. We'll order a second one for the table. Everyone will share a couple. It'll be great. Nice. Nice. Friday night football to kick off week 14 is the Montreal Alouettes being three and a half point favorites over the BC Lions. The over under here is set at 50. Point five. The Alouettes are coming off the bye. I find this to be a fascinating matchup. Uh, the Lions mm-hmm. coming off a big win and touchdown Pacific over the Ottawa Red Blacks. I, I think maybe we're going to find out here uh, if these reps and that win for the Lions is going to carry over into a road game in La Belle Provence, but man, uh, the reigning Grey Cup champs keep finding ways to win, so that's another tough test for the uh, surging. I don't know. Do we, I guess I can't call them surging. It's been one win uh, <laughs> for the BC Lions, but tough for them to string two in a row anyway. Yeah, like I think this is, that game that they played against Ottawa was the game that everyone expected the first game to be that Rourke was back, and, and kind of how BC was playing before Vernon Adams got hurt. Uh, it, on paper, this looks like it's going to be a great matchup, but we all know that not only is Montreal coming off the bye, and and I think I think they're going to perform a little better off the bye than Calgary did last week, and that's a long travel from BC all the way to Montreal, uh, and technically, I guess on a short week because they played Saturday and they're playing again on Friday here. So uh, the the deck, I think, is stacked up against BC. But at the same time, I think if you ask people about four weeks ago, five weeks ago, what uh, the odds on Grey Cup matchup was going to be, people probably would have said BC versus Montreal. So uh, I'm looking forward to this game and hopefully, uh, hopefully it's fireworks for us uh, CFL fans. Another interesting signing for the BC Lions is they bring back DB Jalen Edwards Cooper. Now, in the offseason, he was a highly touted addition to the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. But remind me what happened here, Sheldon. Did he fail a physical? Uh, yeah, in training I believe, camp? yeah. Yeah, he failed a physical. Uh, I was stoked on the signing, even though I really didn't even have a clue who he was. But when you're a, when you're a defensive back and nobody knows your name, that's a really good thing. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so obviously he was able to heal up, and and the riders didn't look at bringing him back. So I guess he goes back to you know the place where he started his CFL career, and hopefully, hey, if there's a team right now that needs help in their secondary and has given up a lot of yards uh, to opposing quarterbacks and receivers, it's BC. So hopefully he's able to slot back in there and help them out, get back to his all star form. Jalen Edwards Cooper can deliver punishing hits, so uh, yeah. yeah, he. I, I'm sure opposing offenses are like, damn it, <laughs> we're going to play against this guy again. Uh, but yeah, he's back in orange and black, and there's a couple storylines, I would say, with this game. Vernon Adams Jr., he's probably going to dress, but as backup for this one, but 
in a stadium. He's very familiar with playing. But so is William mm-hmm. Standback, a uh, running back, uh, very familiar with playing in Montreal. And I do feel like Standback's been getting more and more involved in that offense for the BC Lions. Uh, the Montreal Alouettes have shown at times this season you can run against them. They do have a mm-hmm. strong defense. They're able to force turnovers and sacks, but they do give up chunks of yards. Uh, the Alouettes giving up over 105 rush yards a game. Maybe another big standback game on tap, returning to the place he used to play. Yeah, returning to the place he used to play, but also the place where he wasn't probably featured as much as maybe he should have been with the, the caliber of a, a running back he was, just because especially last season, Jason Moss just doesn't really use his running backs in a, in a typical manner. I know this year he's using uh, Fletcher with a lot of uh, outside swing passes and stuff like that to get him involved. But uh, I, I think there's a reason that William Standback isn't with Montreal anymore. And I think that's probably because he wasn't pl- at played as much as he was hoping. And uh like you said, he's been coming on really good in the, in the past couple of games here, and and you know he's going to want to show up and show out in front of those crowd. Walter Fletcher has 483 rushing yards through 11 games this year, but he's got 461 receiving yards. So he's yeah. almost got the same amount. Uh, mm-hmm. So yeah, that's where uh, he shines in that Alouettes uh, offense for sure, and the Alouettes being back at practice. This week, we know that with some of the uh, injuries in the receiving core, their depth is being tested. But now we're starting to see guys get healthy and how the Alouettes are going to be handling that. Uh, Kayon Julian Grant is dressed. Um, Wednesday, they did say it was a full practice for him. He is going to be out for Friday's game against the Lions. But Tyler Sneed was back taking reps in the Alouettes offense in practice. They do have him listed as questionable on the injury report. Looks like Reggie White Jr., uh, they have him listed on the practice roster right now, but he was taking starter reps. So there are going to be some shifts with that receiving core in the coming weeks for the Alouettes. It did appear that Austin Mack tweaked his ankle in practice. Um icing that thing up it was just a routine catch kind of thing I don't know if that's going to affect his uh, ability to uh, be the uh, dynamic receiver he is on Friday but definitely a situation to watch with that Alouette's Mm -hmm. offense Um, the Lions here uh, I think now their offense has left some things to be desired over the past few weeks especially getting you know, shut out by Winnipeg uh, not too long ago. Um, but their defense, too, has been not, you know, <laughs> not the force that they were last year. Of course, Matthew Betts was a big part of that success last year. He's back. He's he's going to be getting more and more up to speed, and he's probably not going to have to rotate out as much as he gets more into game shape here. But mm-hmm. pressuring Cody Fajardo for the Lions just has to be a key because pressuring opposing quarterbacks has just not been a strength of that defense, leaving the secondary out to dry in many cases. Yeah, and and Cody's the kind of guy that if you can pressure him, if you can rattle him, that's when he is sometimes going to make those mistakes. But at the same time, that's also sometimes when he's going to just take the ball and run and uh, and make things happen. So uh, it, it's going to be an interesting matchup. Uh, spoiler alert: I think I have him in fantasy, so I think I think this matchup benefits Cody a lot. Uh, but uh, Matthew Betts is going to be looking to you know add to his. Uh, his right now uh, on pace for one sack per game. <laughs> <laughs> hey, maybe he uh, uh, is auditioning for next year too. He's only signed for the rest of the well, year. Would Matthew Betts ne- want to yeah, play ne- at home uh, yeah. next year and in the future? I think I think Matthew Betts is going wherever they're going to pay him the most if he's staying in the CFL. I think he's, I think he's got that distinction. I think he deserves to be. Uh, the the top paid defensive player in the league. So we'll see what happens there. 
Let's go to Saturday where there are three games. And I don't think we can quite call it a triple header because they do overlap. And the game, (laughs) the early game on Saturday, this is a huge game with uh, big implications in East Division standings. It is the Ottawa Red Blacks listed as one and a half point favorites over the visiting Toronto Argonauts. The over under at 51 and a half. Here Now, the Ottawa Red Blacks, they're currently, if the playoffs started today, would have a home playoff game, 7-3-1. and one. But the Argos are kind of right on their tail at 6-5. and five. If you look at the home and away splits, like some teams have some really big discrepancies here. The Argos are great at home, 5-1, and one, but on the road, 1-4. and four. The Ottawa Red Blacks... Undefeated at home, 5-0-1, but they're coming off that tough loss against the BC Lions. And the game before, I think there were some injuries that really affected their performance in touchdown Pacific. And now, I guess one of the biggest stories of the week is the Ottawa Red Blacks releasing Rock Armstead. And bringing in Jamal Morrow. Now, Morrow had, I think, 350 receiving yards with the Riders last year, over 900 rushing yards in 16 games. So there's a good chance that he would have had 1,000 yards on the ground if he played the full season. I know a lot of people are puzzled about the Rock Armstead thing. I think this is just attitude issues. Uh, A few weeks ago, didn't he get ejected from a game in about 20 minutes by taking two misconduct penalties? I've heard about his conduct during uh, Touchdown Pacific, running up and down the sideline, chirping the fans, saying he's the best running back in the league and swearing and hollering and all this kind of stuff. And We've seen this before in the CFL. Do you remember Corey Boyd? At one point, he was leading the CFL in rushing during the Mm -hmm. summer for the Argos, and they let him go. The CFL is a small league. If you're going to act like an idiot and have uh, attitude problems, sometimes (laughs) the attitude just seems to trump talent. And the Red Blacks saying, hey, he's not a fit in our locker room. It's best for our team to let him go, but still a surprising story coming out of Ottawa. Yeah. Kind of reminds me of, uh, I know he's not, he's, this is his first season, so you can't really compare, but uh, Deron Carter, Deron Carter had, you know, two or three places where he was amazing, played well, but his, his attitude and his, uh, his off field stuff kind of got in the way there. Um, So, but the good thing about the CFL and for Rock Armstead is the CFL is a league of second chances. So I'm sure that another team is going to sign him because, look, he has been really good. And maybe something like this is going to humble him and maybe he can take do some self-reflection and see that maybe, you know, even if you think you are the best running back in the league, maybe don't spout off and, and, and do stuff like that and maybe be a better teammate and and uh you know that i i'm sure there's a couple teams out there that could use a, a running back that is as dynamic as him especially once we're getting into you know close to the playoffs but we'll be interesting to see if if he lands anywhere but at the same time jamal morrow coming in uh he's somebody who's as you said been able to do it in this league and uh I'm glad that it it's worked out for him. I'm glad he was able to heal whatever that injury was that, you know, k- kind of kiboshed his return a couple times so far this season with the Calgary Stampeders. So uh, he's he's in he's in red and white and black, just a different kind of shade now. So uh, I hope it works out for him. Yeah, good for Jamal Morrow. I think he's a great guy to have in your locker room, a great guy to have in the community. Uh, So good for Ottawa uh, being able to bring a running back of his caliber into the offense. Um, It does appear Devontae Dedman is hurt here, uh, dealing with a hand injury. I actually think, well, no, I love Dedman, and I do think there is a bit of a drop-off, but... When they bring in Brandon Dandridge, he's certainly a capable returner, and he has had mm-hmm. return touchdowns. Um, so having Deadman healthy for the playoffs and going forward, if he does sit out this one, hopefully he gets healthy for later on and they're able to have him in there. 
um, you know, down the stretch. But that special teams, man, you, you don't want uh, <laughs> uh, And Ottawa special teams has been, I think, a strength of that team for mm-hmm. a long time. Uh, they, they probably mm-hmm. have the longest tenured punter kicker combo in the league now i know a lot of times when they're the stars of your team <laughs> that's, that reminds me of the raiders uh for like a decade <laughs> having leckler and Seabass. like <laughs> yeah when, when you're only pro bowler for five years in a row is the punter maybe that's a problem but uh <laughs> leone and yeah. ward hey stars in the cfl and they've always had Good returners. Hopefully, Deadman will be able to get back on the field. But uh, the Red Blacks have had, uh, they've only like dressed one running back over the past little while here. So, if you know, you know when uh, uh, Armstead got kicked out of the game a few weeks ago, Addison was playing running yeah. back. I think Deadman was. It'll be interesting to see if they stay with that short of, sort of strategy. But it's fun to watch the roster construction because in Edmonton, they got three. On the, on the roster in, in one, and uh, all teams are just kind of doing it a different way. Um, mm-hmm. For the Argos here, I know we got to talk about them, but uh, hey, Chad Kelly at times looked a little bit better in the Labor Day game. On other times, he's slipping and running into the back of his own offensive lineman. Mm-hmm. So. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that was hilarious. What a shame. <laughs> what a shame. <laughs> no, that, I, I don't think it's controversial to offer the, you know, observation that the Red Blacks defensive line is better than Hamilton's. So mm-hmm. if he's going to continue to be uncomfortable in the pocket, that, that's a big plus for the Red Blacks at home in this one. It is, uh, but the they are going to have to contain him because I think uh, in the second game, he was able to scramble a lot better than he was against uh, the Riders. Uh, and I think every game he's... Listen, like, say what you want about him off the field. On the field, he's a really, really good quarterback. Uh, so he's he's going to he's gonna continue to get back into that uh, that game shape. Like, listen, listen, a graphic came up on the, on the, the game here. Him, Bo Levi Mitchell, and I can't remember who the other person is, are the only three teams or three quarterbacks to start uh, 16 and two in their first 18 games. So uh, he's he's in some elite Wasn't company it Jackie there. Jackie Parker or something crazy? Uh, like yeah, it might have. Yeah. Yeah, 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 I think it might have been. Yeah. So uh, like we have to give credit where credit is due with his play on the field, regardless of what we think of him off the field. Uh, but Ottawa is a tough test and Ottawa they are going to want to keep that separation for that home playoff game. And uh, I assume they still have another game later this season. So they could probably win this. I can't remember what the season series is with them, but um, you know, this is the time of of the year that season series and wins are starting to, to factor in. So it's a crucial play. It's a crucial game for them to win. And I think it'll be extra satisfying for them to be able to knock Chad on his ass a few times and get a few picks and et cetera. Now, this is actually the first game of the season between Toronto and Ottawa, and they do play again October 19th mm-hmm. in Toronto. Uh, but the Red Blacks, they only have one uh, West Division game for the rest of the season. That is against the Riders at the end of the month. The rest of their schedule is Argos, Ticats, and Alouettes. So Mm -hmm. um, we're going to see, you know, how they're because so far the West has kind of struggled Uh, and we're going to see what kind of team the Red Blacks are because they've Mm -hmm. got two games against the Argos and two games against the Alouettes uh, coming up Mm -hmm. before uh, the end of the year. So uh, we'll see what these Red Blacks are truly made of because uh, there's a lot of people that still think that uh, seven three and one is uh, kind of smoke and mirrors right now but hey they're winning their home games and uh, that's the big difference because in the past those are games they weren't winning <laughs> they were well, really struggling yeah. there and they were able to go into calgary and knock off calgary who was undefeated at home in that period yeah. Yeah. since then they are winless at home <laughs> uh, but um, so that just proves that they were able to get that kind of demon off their back because previous to that game, they, they weren't able to win on the road. 
Uh, so they've now shown that they can win on the road. Listen, last week going to going to Victoria with all the pomp and circumstance, it, that was a tough game for them. But now they're back at home, and uh, they're going to have, uh, I, I think, a better showing than last week. Some uncharacteristic moments last week uh, for the Argos against the Ticats. Um, with regards to giving up the big play on defense. So, Winton McManus, he's limited in practice, dealing with a groin issue. If they're able to get him back into the lineup, that's massive for the Argos. Now, Deshaun yeah. Amos is not practicing. He's dealing with a shoulder issue. We saw him go down against the Ticats. He also got burned a few times when they gave up those big plays to Tim White. So, if they do have to make mm-hmm. a change in the secondary, it'll be interesting to see what the Red Blacks are going to do to target that and which receivers really get rolling for the tie cats here because there have been some injuries there and there have been some other players stepping up in the absence of a guy like Jalen Acklin. I do wonder, um, maybe we see, and I, I've been waiting for it, you know, more Dominic Rhymes. Last week he had four catches, 46 yards. He did have a touchdown. But last week Eli Stove had eight catches on nine targets for 73 yards in his first game. We'll see if he continues mm-hmm. to produce for the Red Blacks offense. Well, and they also got Rasheed Bailey on the practice roster, right? So maybe he can uh, find his way onto the roster this week, too. Let's go to the Banjo Bowl. Uh, this is the first game we have to. <laughs> of the season on CTV. Uh, so one o'clock Mountain, I guess three Eastern on uh, CTV, available to everybody across Canada. I think a pretty uh, interesting way to show off the CFL to all of Canada. They're going to see that atmosphere in Winnipeg and think, they're either terrified or they want to be a part of it. <laughs> um, the riders do come in with some injury issues. Uh, and we saw them have the injury issues during the Labor Day game. Peter Godber and Zach Fry are out. So Noah Zare is expected to start at left guard. His first career start. Logan Furlan starting at center. Nick Jones at right guard. So, Sheldon, that means three Americans on the offensive line for the Riders. But, I mean, with that Canadian depth at receiver, I guess they're able to adjust and, uh, you know, make that work. But it's just another offensive line combination for the Riders, which, man, I, I guess that you change the head coach, you change so many things over the past few years, but the more things change, the more they stay the same with that offensive line issues in Saskatchewan. Yeah, it's just been the Achilles heel for a number of years. Uh, I, I've been wanting to see what Noah Zer can do uh, ever since we we drafted him. Uh, I think it's taken him a while to get to the place where he's able to actually start, so Hopefully, we can see some growth there. Um, Furland is Furland's pretty indispensable. I think he can do everything, uh, but he did struggle, I think, when he went in there for Godber during the game. Uh, after, I think, well, Fry first took over for Godber, but then after Fry got hurt and then Micah Johnson slotted it and they moved Furland there, and, and I don't think he did great, but he has played well before at center in filling in, so I think he's... He's like the five-tool O-lineman. He can play any position. So I think uh, I'm hopeful that with a full week of practice, he's able to nail that down. Um, as far as the Canadian issues go, I think it's easy. You, you sit Sean Bain Jr., you start a Joe a Joe, and that's literally the change that I would do. You could still have Sean Bain uh, returning kicks maybe and, and then sit uh, – sit Mario Alford, that's, again, what I would do. But I don't get paid the big bucks to coach. Logan Furland probably, at this point, the team's nominee for most outstanding offensive lineman. The guy has been uh, doing everything. Yeah, Yeah, he has to be. Unless there's nobody else, literally, that could be the the nominee. 
Now, attending games, like you, you notice things differently in the stands than uh, on TV. And there were a few snaps that uh, <laughs> Trevor Harris, it was, I would have totally dropped them. Let's just say that, like getting like a goalie in the, in the NHL or something. He's had to do a couple one-handed recoveries on some quick snaps. But uh, hopefully that is yeah. not an issue, especially on the road in a game like the Banjo Bowl. So Noah Zare, you know, uh, went to the University of Saskatchewan. He's a Husky getting his first start, six foot seven. And hey, <laughs> talk Good about boy. being thrown to the wolves. <laughs> You are going to be going against not only that Winnipeg Blue Bomber defense, but also that Winnipeg Blue Bomber uh, crowd. Um, Receiver Dante Myers for the Riders had his arm in a sling at practice. They were waiting for more uh, details on that. But when I hear sling, that doesn't sound good. (laughs) I don't know if... They want to call it precautionary or whatever it is. But when I hear things like sling and walking boot, I'm not so hopeful about his availability for the Banjo Bowl. No, me neither. Uh, But again, we have lots of we have a depth of receiver that is good. So I'm not too worried about our receivers. I'm more worried about our quarterback being able to throw the ball to the receivers. (laughs) <laughs> uh, speaking of quarterbacks, Zach Kalaris practicing in full for the Winnipeg. Wow. <laughs> That's miraculous how he's healed so quickly. <laughs> Careful. you would be called the biased Homer idiot on our YouTube channel again. Um, but that's fine. That, that's fine. <laughs> I, 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 that's fine. <laughs> I will say this. I, uh, and this is just things you hear. I, I heard that maybe the uh, training staff were working on Caleros in his shoulder and his kind of chest area. Um, and you remember he missed a game uh, with the thorax issue this year. Mm-hmm. And I wonder mm-hmm. if maybe that is what got aggravated in the Miles Brown hit um do you do you mean where miles brown is actually intending to hit not the actual helmet to helmet that everyone thinks it was intended the the sarcasm is thick there you can get yourself in trouble i'm just trying to say (laughs) i'm saying hey i'm not saying he didn't hit him with the head he hit him with the head that was a penalty but i'm saying I'm pretty sure that hit that he put on Chad Kelly the week previous, that was a, a like a good, like, you know, solid hit that he just hit him right into. Like, I assume that's what he was trying to do to Zach. He just hit him with his head. That's that's all I'm saying. He still did hit him with his head. Should have been a penalty. I'm upset that Claros got hurt because I don't want him to get hurt. But it's just it's frustrating to see one quarterback get extra calls just because of his injury history. I don't think that's fair. Well, I think that would have been what should have been a penalty on any. No, I know. I know. But it just like there's other questionable hits that he's gotten. And so that makes that when even when there is a legitimate hit, it it, it just makes people frustrated. Right. Like, I'm not saying it's right. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying it is. I uh, um, uh, I guess what I'm saying about Kolaros, and I think that kind of makes more sense, at least to me, um, yeah. because he never formally entered concussion protocol, and I, no. I don't think it would be responsible of the Bombers if he had uh, a head problem on that play to keep him out of concussion protocol just to be sure that he played in the Banjo Bowl. I, I, and I, I, I agree. So I agree. So I at least I that makes sense to me, and I, and it also makes yeah. sense to me why the bombers would not say why. Uh, oh, for sure, <laughs> why he was precautionary uh, held out. Yeah. you know. Yeah, no, I I completely agree, and I understand. Like like Mike O'Shea is one of the best coaches when it comes to gamesmanship oh, against yeah. the other coaches. So uh, I'm not mad about it. It's just it's just a funny little joke because. You know, like I like even we were talking about in the in the crowd and and other people because the whole seven day concussion protocol and and you just you automatically assume that when 
a quarterback gets hit in the head and goes down and gets taken out of the game, that it is a concussion. And especially with a uh, with a player like Zach, yeah. who has yeah. such a history of the concussion. So I'm honestly happy that he's not in concussion protocol because I don't want to see him get hit in the head anymore. And I don't want to see him have any more concussions because I want him to be able to spend time with his grandkids. Mm-hmm. I don't want him to have CTE and all that other crap. So... I'm glad he's not in concussion protocol and I'm glad he's playing because we do need our star quarterbacks playing in the games, especially when it's a big rivalry game. Like, listen, this is for the season series between the Riders and the Bombers. So I want the best players playing. Yeah. And it, I mean, it is a conversation to have. It does feel like the starting quarterbacks in the CFL are more hurt on a regular basis than the starting quarterbacks in the NFL, which mm-hmm. uh, I, I think we got to figure out why. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, some of these things are Achilles and ACLs and non-contact and thing like that. And I don't know how you prevent that. But uh, a lot of them are uh, hits (laughs) one way or another. I don't know if it's, you know, the offensive lines being unable to provide the proper amount of protection or on the officials and on player safety. But it definitely is an important conversation to have uh, in that regard. If we're really... If we're really talking about player safety and quarterback safety, then the quarterback should probably be wearing guardian caps. Yeah, I don't think that's uh, unreasonable to to mm-hmm. suggest here. And uh, I think people are wondering if that's going to be a thing that uh, gets grandfathered in in the next few years. Maybe mm-hmm. the uh, older quarterbacks have the choice, but the new quarterbacks, look, you got to wear this thing to keep yourself yeah. safe. I see it being maybe tested in the this the U sports level first and made mandatory there and then then you might see some players who, you know, let's say two draft classes from now, if they're if they're mandated to wear them in U sports, then maybe uh that's when it becomes kind of mandatory for those players in the CFL to start having to wear them. It looks like the Bombers are going to be without Lucky Whitehead and Adam Big Hill. Um the Big Hill one uh he, he, it was kind of a crazy play. He kind of went airborne between the guard and the center, and then he got hit low by the running back, which is legal. I don't think it should be. <laughs> That's just me. I, I think defenders, uh, they get the short end of the stick all the time. Like, you, you can't touch a quarterback. You can barely touch a receiver. And then a running back can lower his head and smash you when you can't do it back. So uh, that, that's yeah. that's a tough one for Biggie. And I, I do think we're probably nearing the end of his career. Um, he's a Hall of Famer. Absolutely. I, I hope. And we'll see. I do hope he's got one more year left in him next year. Winnipeg hosting the Grey Cup, but it does look like Big Hill's going to miss some time for this one. Lucky Whitehead, uh, he did get hurt against the Riders. It looked like he gutted it out for later in the game, um, but he he might miss this one as well. But the Bombers mm-hmm. have great news along their offensive line. Uh, Stanley Bryant, they talked about him maybe being able to play in the Labor Day game after that scare a couple weeks ago, the dehydration issue, the overheating issue. Looks like he's going to play in the Banjo Bowl, but it also looks like Pat Newfeld is going to be back on the offensive line in the interior for the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. That is a big addition to this O-line. He's missed some significant time. And I remember him as a rider thinking, man, this guy, I don't know. He doesn't get it done. And then he went to Winnipeg and become one of the best interior linemen in the CFL. So that's a big addition for the Bombers. Yeah, the what. It's. I often wonder if, if 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 he would have been able to just grow here and stay here, and he could have been that anchor of our O line. But um, I gotta be I, honest. I've, I think it's the system that Saskatchewan has yeah. been using. Like Derek Dennis comes to Saskatchewan, and all of a sudden he's a problem. Or Pat Newfeld goes to Winnipeg, and all of a sudden he's an all star. Like, oh, what's going on there? Yeah. You know? <laughs> I I think that Derek Dennis. I don't know if it was so much the system. I think it was just Jones wanting to play a different. Position. Position. I and think he was that's, dealing with injuries. Yeah. yeah, I think I think that was it for Derek Dennis. But but yeah, there's there's no denying that there's there's something wrong in the water when it comes to the, <laughs> the O line in the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. And uh, 
and and, and good for Pat for being able to get out of there and to, <laughs> to thrive somewhere else, uh, honestly. So is this a must win for the Riders? Yes. And it's not a position that you want to be in a must win situation going into the Banjo Bowl where the past two years, they both gave o- over 50 points in the past two games. So yeah. if the Riders go to Winnipeg again, I don't think there's any moral victories if they lose by two or three. Uh, close isn't enough. They, they did that. Like, would you be encouraged if they go to Winnipeg and they lose by a field goal rather than lose by 45? Yeah. To be honest, like maybe a little bit, but at the same time, I'm 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 sick and tired of losing by one, two, three, four points, which has been what these six games has been. But Elks at the fans same time, are familiar with that. <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. Uh, but at the same time, like we're expecting to go to Winnipeg and to lose by 20 or 30 or 40. So if, if, if the riders can keep it close there in hostile territory with the injury issues that they have, then yeah, maybe it can be a a moral victory if you will. But, but Trevor Harris and, and, and coach Mace both said at the end of the game, like we need to stop having moral victories and we need to have actual victories. But also, I I say it's a must win just because I need the I, or the riders need to get off of this slide. But at the same time, they're still pretty much in the driver's seat when it comes to their position because, you know, all games except for one left are against Western opponents. They have three of the last four games at home, which is a huge thing, and they have two bye weeks in there to get healthy. So I, I still think with how close the West is. Uh, it's not like the riders are looking for rider math already and, and having to see teams win or lose and stuff for them to get in. You know, there's still one point out of first place. Surprisingly, after going 0-5-1 and in the last six games. Whoever so, wins this wins the season series, right? Right, but the riders have that extra point in that tie. Yeah. So that kind of, that kind of takes away any season series, it seems. But I just think the riders, if, if they're the team that they think they are, and, and Trevor Harris was quoted saying that he still thinks that this is a great cup caliber team. If they're a great cup caliber team, you need to be able to go in and, and win some games that maybe you shouldn't, and that's the Banjo Bowl. The Winnipeg Blue Bombers just came in and won a game that they shouldn't, and that was the Lager Day Classic. Uh, so, and that starts and know, ends with Trevor Harris. He needs if he plays like he did against uh, Toronto, they ain't winning. <laughs> no, but he played the way he played against Winnipeg, and and if it wasn't for listen, I'm going to say it, if it wasn't for Mario Alford, yeah, they win that yeah. game. Yeah, so they do. Uh, I think. So they they need to. They need to find a way to get a complete game from all three phases. They've had two phases do it, and they've lost. They've had two phases do it and win early in the season, but now it seems like they're going to need all three phases together to win. They need to go in there. They need to take the crowd out of it early because if if Winnipeg goes in there and they march down the field first, first drive and they score a touchdown – that's pretty much game over already because you know that crowd's going to just be so pumped and amped and one decibel louder than Labor Day because of all the metal in there. And it, it it's just so hard. I, I've been to the last four Banjo Bowls, I think. I'm not going this season. It, it's a tough it's a tough environment to crack. Uh, I've only seen one win <laughs> in those four games. So. Man, I don't even know. Uh how you take that Winnipeg crowd out of it. The thing is, if you let the Bombers have a fast start, well, I I think it's almost certainly done. (laughs) Yeah, you have to have them not like their quarterback already and then throw two pick sixes and then have their quarterback's face come up on a drunk driving uh, (laughs) thing and then you boo him. That's how you take the crowd out of it in Winnipeg. (laughs) But no, it's, it's like... Honestly, like it, you have to, the riders have to score like three or four touchdowns 
without the Bombers doing anything if they want to take the crowd out of it. They have to get pick sixes. They have to get fumbles. They have to get sacks. Like, it's a return touchdown. Like, it's it's all hands on deck to be able to win this game. And And like I said, if they're the team they think they are, they should be able to do it. But spoiler alert, I don't think they're going to do it. I really hope that it's a close, entertaining game for the first game on CTV. Although Bomber yeah. fans, I'm sure they want another 51 to six victory over Too bad. the Melon Heads. Uh, the Edmonton Elks, home to the Calgary Stampeders, in this Labor Day rematch to wrap up Week 14. The Elks are two and a half point favorites. Now, I really thought, you know, I think a lot thought. Calgary was going to win that Labor Day game, the biggest crowd of the year coming off the bye. The Elks coming in, you know, uh, after they had, uh, I mean, I know they're on a roll, uh, but the Elks had that loss in Montreal and they come in and they stomp the Stampeders. And if the Elks win this game, oh boy, a sweep against the Stamps was... I think beforehand absolutely massive and now it appears that there's a real opportunity we've been here before with the Elks and I know Elks fans are still kind of shell-shocked a little bit especially when it comes to home games well now they're at home and now they get a chance to prove to us that Jarius Jackson and the rest of the squad is just a different team they do have the highest scoring team in the CFL 348 points scored on the season. The next highest is actually Saskatchewan at 312. Now, there are several teams that have played one game less, so that does add uh, to the numbers there. But but for Calgary, I want to ask you, man, is this one of Jake Mayer's last chances as the starting quarterback? It should be. Like he's uh, maybe I was too harsh on him in the beginning, like last season, but like that was a terrible performance at home in your biggest game of the season, uh, like biggest game of the regular season, Labor Day. Uh, it was <laughs> it it was brutal, and and we've seen Jake be Jekyll and Hyde up and down and for whatever it was, the home crowd seemed to be able to get the best out of him, but they weren't able to do that for him this time. And and now it's been two games in a row where they haven't won at home. I think... Uh, I, I think if you're Dave Dickinson, you have to have a short leash on him, but at the same time, do you have a guy behind him that you trust? Uh, you don't know that. We saw Bonner come in and... and he he made some throws, but uh, unless you can somehow find a way to get to the one yard line so that Tommy Stevens can come in and score touchdowns for you, uh, you, you got to find a way. But I, I think if Jake Mayer doesn't start lighting the league on fire pretty quickly, it's time to move on from Jake Mayer because uh, you you can't. This Calgary computer quarterback factory has been going, 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 and now you finally have, have seen a miss, I think, and it's time to get off that train and try to find your next guy if if, if I'm Dave Dickinson. No. I, I think at the beginning of the year when the Stamps brought in Matt Schiltz, there was maybe some thought that if Jake Mayer faltered, that Schiltz would be able to step in. And he's a guy that has made plays with the Alouettes and with the Ticats, but Schiltz is on the six-game injured list, so that doesn't help. Um, mm-hmm. And But is I, he actually hurt, or are they just stashing I, him that's there? That's true. I'm not, I'm, not, yeah. I'm not sure on that. Now, Jake Mayer is only 27 years old. There is something to be said about having patience with... Uh, a quarterback in the CFL. And I think we've seen many guys that haven't blossomed until a little bit later on, finally getting, Mm -hmm. you know, a hold of the CFL game. But I don't, I don't know if the stamps like in the past, I feel like they've had such a strong nucleus that a quarterback can come in and be supported by the receivers and the O line and the running game. 
that's not there this year. The, the old line is not as strong as it has been. It's been a revolving door at running back with personal issues and injuries and all that. And I know they got Reggie Bagleton and uh, Mark and Michelle there. So I, I don't think the receivers are like last year. The receivers were struggling in yeah. Calgary. I don't think it's a problem yeah. this year. No, but the, the defense is a problem um, for the stamps. And I don't think the D line is getting enough pressure uh, and Awe and Judge are solid linebackers, and the revolving door in the secondary hasn't been making it happen for the Stamps, but they're, they're just not coming together, and that is uncharacteristic of a Calgary team, and I never thought, like, this has been almost two decades of lineages, you know, with Huff to Dickinson, and then I think everybody kind of assumed maybe Dickinson goes to the GM chair, and then uh, Killam steps in as the head coach. I don't know if fans really want to be that patient anymore. Well, I I don't know if the fans are really happy with the the way that Dickinson has been GM, uh, because... Like, Up's kid, I think, is now the scout or one of the scouts, and he's yeah. been getting some uh, criticism. Yeah, but like they've let some some players go that maybe they sh- you would think that they wouldn't, and and some of the some of the resignings or like I said the the just the trust I guess that he's had in Jake Mayer, uh, I think. I think that's become a, a point of contention for some fans because they're getting fed up. And and like you said, it's been decades. Calgary fans aren't used to losing. And, uh, you know, as fans of other teams, I think we can, we can enjoy sometimes seeing Calgary lose. But uh, the fact is that when Calgary, when Calgary isn't losing, it's not good. Or when Calgary isn't winning, it's not good for those fans there, and, and it's going to affect ticket sales. It's going to affect all that stuff. So, uh, we want we want fans showing up in McMahon, as as tough as that may be, because it's McMahon. We want fans showing up there, <laughs> uh, but they need to they need to figure it out. And 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 just just another reason why I I I don't like the coach's cap. I don't like the fact that I think. Some teams, Calgary included, are handcuffed by having to have coach and GM wear the same hat just because they can't afford to go out and get an actual GM and coach. So I think we're starting to see uh, the coach's cap effect on field. It, it, it's not just the season. It happened before. I think that was a, a lot of Edmonton's issues. Um, so hopefully that can get looked on the off season. But back to back to Dave Dickinson in Calgary, they need to figure it out. They need to, if Jake's not the guy, you need to figure it out now and and start building. Because if they get swept here, I think they're in last place. And they are. <laughs> and, and that's pretty, you know, amazing for Elk fans, but pretty sad for Stampeder fans to see just that, that kind of switch there. So if they get swept by Edmonton, the temperature is going to be cranked up even more, man. <laughs> Oh, for sure there is. Yeah, for sure. Wow. So McLeod Bethel Thompson is going to start for Edmonton. And I, I think this is an interesting conversation to have, too. This is over the past three games. MBT, 920 yards passing, seven touchdowns, zero interceptions. Yeah. I, I yeah, don't I was, think he can take him out right now. Yeah, I was arguing with a guy about my power rankings, uh, saying that he thought that the stamp should have been last uh, because they made Mikhail Bethel Thompson look like an actual good quarterback. And I was like, uh, he, he's been playing pretty good ever since he got back in there. So I, I don't think it's just the stamps that made him do that. Uh, he's he's looks like a guy who lost his job. <laughs> And then was able to get it back and decided, I don't want to lose my job again. So like Bo. we're gonna Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like we're gonna we're gonna perform here. And I'm not saying he didn't want to perform before, but you know, when that's what happens when you're in a professional athlete and you have backups, and if your backups, you know, get ahead of you on the depth chart, it lights a fire under your ass to get better. And it looks like that's happened in both of those cases. 
I think maybe Elks fans, they would still like to see, like Hamilton did with Talia Tagovailoa on Labor Day, get mm. forward into those chances. And now mm-hmm. I think defenses would have to respect that Ford is going to to be able to pass too, uh, yeah. Tag of Aloha, they I don't think maybe he had one pass, uh, but th- you knew that he was going to run, and you know your team's mm-hmm. in trouble if you know the team's going to run and you can't stop it. But imagine yeah. the Elks; <laughs> they've got Kevin Brown, they've got Javon Leak, they've got Justin Rankin and Trey Ford. You don't know where the darn ball's going to go, <laughs> and uh, hey, th- they'd be able to run it all over the place, every which direction and in any way that they want it. I, there is a lot of opportunities uh, for the Elks offense going forward here. Three receivers over 100 yards on Labor Day. One of them over 200. McLeod Bethel Thompson having a career game with 486 passing yards and like you said, the the fumble recovery didn't count towards those yards. He might have had 550 or whatever it was. Uh, maybe McLeod Bethel Thompson's leash is short, but you have to stick with the hot hand. But there's also been a change on defense. Before, they couldn't... Well, maybe they forced turnovers, but the offense was turning over the ball at a similar rate. Now... Mm-hmm. They are forcing turnovers. Their DBs are coming down with the ball. They're forcing fumbles. And I think the D-line has really come together. Sean Oakman, on Labor Day, I thought he had his best game of the year, even though Sean McEwen was back in the lineup uh, for the Stamps, an all-star at center. But, And I know it's the same with the Banjo Bowl, sometimes beating a team or at least, you know, dominating a team twice in a row is difficult to do. Maybe the Elks aren't able to dominate the Stamps again, but there probably isn't going to be much change in their game plan, and (laughs) you just have to execute like you did on Monday in the Labor Day game, and you probably have similar success. And this is probably going to be the biggest crowd of the year for the Elks. If they win this, we're off to the races down the stretch. They do play Mm -hmm. Calgary again in October. They play Saskatchewan. Playoffs are a real possibility for the Elks. And we're saying this about a team that started 0-7. I know. This year has been so crazy. (laughs) I have no more analysis than just that. This year is nuts. And... For chaos, I would love to see Edmonton make the playoffs after that. Well, I'm looking at this. They won the season series with BC. Mm-hmm. So, they still could win the season series with Saskatchewan when they play them, too. So passing BC, that's not out of the realm. of Like, BC plays the reigning Grey Cup champs on Friday. If the Elks win, they're only one game back. Mm-hmm. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Now, I don't want to put this into the universe, (laughs) but if these Lions, uh, I don't know. Miss the playoffs? (laughs) I know. No, I don't know. Okay, if you had to predict the West right now, where's the West final and where is the West semifinal? If I had to predict it the way I think it's going to go, the West Finals in Winnipeg and the West Semifinal is in BC. It could be Edmonton going to BC. Um, but if the Elks continue this string, <laughs> imagine a West Semifinal in Edmonton with the BC Lions coming to town. Or how about in Edmonton with the Riders coming to town? Ooh, that could happen too. Or in Edmonton with the Hamilton Tiger Cats. <laughs> hey, let's not get too crazy. <laughs> oh, this 2024 season has been a blast. Like, I don't remember a, a, a season like Oof. this since this pod started where there's just been so many crazy things going on. Next season is going to be so mid just to make up for it. 
<laughs> I hope so. <laughs> uh, let's talk about our fantasy lineups going into week 14. I've loaded up okay. the top half of my lineup. Uh, McLeod Bethel Thompson is my... Now, the last time I picked him, he got pulled and Trey Ford came into the game. So uh, let's see what happens there. But I got McLeod as my quarterback, Brady Oliveira, and William Stanback as my running backs. My uh, rest of my three are Curly Gittens Jr., Dominic Rimes, Aiden Eberhard of the BC Lions, and the Elks defense with $400 left over, Sheldon. I have Cody Fajardo as my quarterback and captain. I have Brady Oliveira and and Walter Fletcher as my running backs. My receivers are Tevin Jones. Uh, I have Charleston Rambo. And I have, where did it go? Sorry. Justin Hardy. And my defense is the Edmonton Elks. And I have $300 left over. All right, my picks for this week, I'm taking the Alouettes to beat the Lions, the Argos to beat the Red Blacks, the Bombers to beat the Riders, and the Elks to beat the Stampeders, Sheldon. Uh, Similar, so I have the Alouettes to win, I have the Red Blacks to win, I have the Bombers to win, and I have the Elks to win. All right, that Home means sweep. I'm not going one and three or zero oh and four uh, this week. <laughs> well, you, you might. I, I, I guess might. I could. <laughs> <laughs> you can rate, review, and subscribe to Two and Out on your favorite podcatcher. You can check it out on uh, YouTube as well. Uh, leave a rating or a. Uh, a subscription there or a comment i should say we really appreciate it uh, the there seems to be new subscribers every day we're at 569 right now nice check out the website to and out.ca you can find our shop there and links to our patreon to support us there as well week 14 of the cfl is on tap he sheldon jones i'm travis curra take care of yourself and each other. Thanks for listening. Find more great shows like this at CF Pod Network on Twitter. 